Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Grant Babcock. Joining us today is our colleague Jason Kuznicki. He's a Cato Institute Research Fellow, editor of Cato Unbound, and he's author of the upcoming book, Technology and the End of Authority, What is Government For? But today we're having him on to talk about a different book, one that just came out, a, a book that Grant and I put together and was published this month uh, called Arguments for Liberty. Arguments for Liberty is a collection of essays by noted scholars on different philosophical arguments for libertarianism. And throughout 2017, we will be interviewing the authors of these chapters to discuss the various moral groundings one might use to justify a libertarian political system. Today we're starting with Jason's chapter, which is on Kant, who is a favorite among libertarians. He certainly, whenever his name comes up on our Facebook page for libertarianism.org, there's lots of nice things said about him. Oh, really? Objectivist Randians tend to have opinions, let's say, they about certainly do. Immanuel Kant. They certainly do. Which we will get to later, but let's start with with Kant himself. Just a bit of bio. Um, who was he? When did he live? Kant lived in uh, in the late late eighteenth century. Uh, he was a German philosopher, considered uh, one of the sort of the founding figure of of. German idealist school of philosophy, uh, sort of a a transitional figure from the Enlightenment into German idealism, and uh, also a, and anyone who studies philosophy knows him as one of the most important philosophers of all time. Okay, so Kant Kant wrote about pretty much everything. Virtually every topic in philosophy, he said something of interest about, and and. You know, wrote it down and, and we've been arguing about it ever since, yes. But our chief concern today and in this chapter in Arguments for Liberty is his moral theory and then his political – his resulting political theory. So Kant started – Kant was not satisfied with existing moral theories when he That's right. created his own because he thought that they were – they reduced to systems of what he called hypothetical imperatives. Hypothetical imperatives. So – if A, then you should B. If you want to understand physics, uh, then you should study mathematics. But then that presupposes that studying physics is a good idea to begin with. Well, why study physics? Well, perhaps it's because you want to obtain uh, a particular machine for, for uh, doing some – you know, purpose some project in the in the physical world. Well, why should you do that? Well, maybe it's because of some other hypothetical imperative. And he found essentially that ethics was running around in circles. Uh, it was chasing after one hypothetical, after another, after another, and they were all in the service of something else. Well, where does it all start? He asked. Where's where's the beginning of all this? Where's so the in the in ethics? This might be like so for for Aristotle, it would be if you want to live well or be happy. Um, then you'll behave in certain ways or embody certain characteristics. For a <clears throat> consequentialist, it might be something like if you want to maximize happiness, then you'll do or not do the following things. What's wrong with that? Well, Kant criticized uh, Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian approaches specifically and and also implicitly criticize the later utilitarian accounts uh, by saying that happiness is something that is mutable from one person to the next. We each have a different idea of happiness and because of that, we're not going to agree on, on uh, what constitutes the good. And if we can't agree on it, then it, that seems to be uh, an account of the good that lacks one of the one of the generally taken as fundamental attributes of goodness, which is that it's it's uh, universal, that it is something that is that is uh, in some way incumbent on or or accessible to any person. Okay, so if we're gonna we're gonna ditch hypotheticals and we're gonna try to find something that's stronger than that, more foundational than that. What is there? This is his his notion of the the goodwill. His antidote was to begin with the goodwill and to say that if there is anything in the world that is unconditionally good, that is good without 
possibility that circumstance or that uh, contingency can disrupt it. It's the goodwill, the desire to do good. And uh, that is a thing that seems prerequisite, he said, to goodness in all circumstances, in all times and places. How is a desire different from the if part of a hypothetical imperative? So if – OK. So a goodwill is fun fundamental but a goodwill is the desire to do good. So now we're stuck back with the definition of good and it sounds an awful lot like if you want to do good, then you will do these things and these things happen to be what we call either that desire or the what those that desire then to do the good things is the goodwill, but it's not it's not filling in the nature of the good. Kant would have resisted the move from uh, desire to uh, satisfaction or happiness. He would have said this is not about happiness. It's about it's about uh, living one's life according to principle, even if perhaps living one's life according to principle leads to unhappiness. He would say. The person who is reflective and rational and thoughtful about their life may choose a life that is good and bind themselves to that life despite the fact that it makes them unhappy simply for goodness's own sake, simply for the, the, uh, the imperative to be good. So uh, this is something that uh, he, would say, he would say is not – easily reconciled with or reducible to utilitarianism. So does Kant even have a conception of the good in the way that uh, the eudaimonist the Greeks did or that the utilitarians do? Well, this is a question that I, he has a conception of the good certainly, but I think it's a different one. I think it's, I think it's fair to say it's a different conception. Uh, there are accounts of the good that are, are similar to his at times and places elsewhere. Uh, the idea that one is obliged, for example, to obey the commandments of God even if those commandments are inexplicable or even if they are horrible, this is something that's found in the Bible. This is, this is the sacrifice that Abraham was asked to make. Uh, so it's, it's actually an ancient idea in ethics that perhaps doing the good is not necessarily going to make you all that happy. Perhaps it's going to be something that's going to be uh, quite daunting, quite fearful, uh, maybe even will make you unhappy, but that's not the point of, of the good in, in this conception of the good. Then how does this, how does this deal then with this the question of moral motivation, which seems to be at the heart of hypothetical imperatives. So you say, OK, that's that's the good and OK, it may not make you happy, um, but but the goodwill, the desire to follow it is what matters. And I respond – so you're, you're trying to convince me to be a Kantian and I respond by saying, why? Like I, like, I kind of want to be happy, you know, um, and, and if – that doesn't sound great if this thing, you know, I, I get it's probably not going to guarantee happiness, but if it's often going to run anathema to happiness, that seems like a knock against it as far as me being motivated to do it. So why should I – what's in it for me or why should I care about Just having a good will? Certainly, will? certainly. Uh, okay. Kant would not have said that happiness is something you must not pursue or something that you must avoid. He would say you must – you must act in certain ways and refrain from acting in other ways. But there's a scope here that allows for the pursuit of happiness. There's, there's nothing wrong with taking happiness to be a value within the context of an otherwise good life. The key though, the absolute key for him was not happiness but to give oneself a moral law in accordance with reason. This was a uh, concept that he termed autonomy. Autonomy for Kant has a very special meaning. It means that a reasoned agent is, is uh, capable of, of legislating for himself over time and of binding him to live according to, according to a reasoned moral law. Just to uh, contextualize Aaron's question a little bit, like so when we talk about uh, motivation in a moral theory, like one attractive feature that a moral theory can have is once I understand what the good is, then I want to pursue it, right? Just by virtue of having understood it. Um, so, and this is this is you know there are a lot of knocks on utilitarianism, for example, but why someone would want to pursue the the utilitarian conception of the good seems pretty clear, right? Uh, why, once I understand uh, 
you know, what it means to live my life, uh, you know, go in this autonomous way, uh, would I be motivated to do that? You would be motivated to do that, uh, Kant, I think, would say, because you recognize that you are ultimately a rational being and that that facet of your being, that aspect of your being uh, entails behaving in certain ways. It's, it's possible for you to neglect that. But that neglect has a uh, has a status of you know, neglecting a duty. It's a, it's an obligation that you have, which once recognized, becomes he would say uh, something that's wrong to ignore. And and to be clear, this isn't a uh, a, a human nature account of uh, of uh, of obligation. Like you know, I'm. It's it's not that you know humans are this way. Therefore, we want to. Uh, govern ourselves accordingly. It's it's what is what's the distinguishing feature. Uh, it is it is not a human nature account because he would say that other rational entities would be equally bound by it. So, for example, he would say that God, uh, assuming God exists, which, which Kant believed, God is also bound by this. Or or angels or aliens or we might say sentient robots would also recognize this and that's actually I mean this is a test that we might be able to run in a few years you know whether the the uh, the intelligent agents we have nowadays would recognize this as as a law that they ought to bind themselves by I don't know does that mean that our our test for whether something is rational is whether it's Kantian well, I don't know if Kant would have put it in such immodest and and you know self congratulatory terms, but but maybe maybe. So how does this get us? Okay, so we've got I mean we get these very broad concepts right now, but how does that get us to then a system of morality of knowing what I ought to do, what I ought not to do, of kind of the action guidance portion of it? Yes. So uh, Kant, as we said, rejected hypothetical imperatives and he substituted for them as, as the groundwork of, of all ethics what he called the categorical imperative. And he gave three different formulas for the categorical imperative and, and when you first encounter them, they sound, they sound fairly different from one another. And he claimed that they were all uh, equivalent to one another, which is which is one of the more confusing things he ever said because uh, he didn't fully explain that, and people have argued about it ever since. But but if if we look at the first formulation of the categorical imperative, it says, "Act as if the maxim of your action were to become by your will a universal law of nature." So imagine that the moral principle that underlies whatever it is you are doing were to become universal and not just universal in the sense that it's incumbent on everyone but that everyone would actually do it just as just as uh, objects fall to a center of gravity or the uh, uh, entropy of the universe gradually increases or, or, or that sort of thing something something that is inevitable can you can you will that this was something that was always and inevitably followed uh, it's it's easy to make caricatures of this, and a lot of times people do. Uh, people would say, "Well, you decided, Jason, to become a historian. Uh, could you really will that everyone in the world would become a historian? Uh, then we would all starve to death because there'd be no food." This is this is a caricature. This is not what Kant was getting at. It was not. It was not intended to be a test of consequences. It was intended to be a test of interior moral maxims. So we don't ask about consequences. We don't ask about what would happen if everyone behaved in literally the exact same way. We look to the moral maxim behind the action. And I might defend my becoming a historian by saying I think it is a maxim that I could will to universalize that people should cultivate their personal talents at least insofar as they do so without harming other people. I don't think I harmed too many other people by becoming a historian uh, but that leaves room for lots of other professions. That leaves room for possible, uh, of course, you know, diversity of professions existing at the same time. I don't have to will that everyone performs literally the same actions that I do. All I need to do is will that they cultivate their particular talents to the best of their ability without harming other people. So if we're not concerned with consequences when we're evaluating a maxim, um, are we – is it just that it's logically possible to will 
such a thing for ever, or that that everyone would that, to will that everyone would act according to this maxim? I think that's the correct understanding. Yes, there are there are lots of people, including some libertarians, who were who were very quick to move from the first formulation of the categorical imperative to saying things like, "Well, if everybody stole, then uh, there'd be bad consequences. Everybody would you know, spend all their time on theft instead of on production, and the world would be miserable and suspicious, and and people would be always afraid." And and while that's all true. Well, that's all true. It's beside Kant's point. Kant's actual point is that you cannot consistently will A, that I am going to be a thief and B, that there will also be an otherwise enduring order of private property within which I exist, that those two things are inconsistent. Uh, you can't will the occasional ad hoc violation of a system that you also endorse. So uh, and that's that's what he would say the act of theft amounts to. So this gets us to the the kind of classic counterexample to Kant um, is the 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 Nazis come to your door about lying. So you shouldn't Kant. You know we we should not lie, um, and we can't will that everyone lies. So you've got a Jewish family hiding in your house and the Nazis come to your door and say, is there a Jewish family hiding in your house? And it would seem if you – Kant saying you have to tell the Nazis the truth seems morally monstrous and seems like a problem for us. Um, so is that – then how do we how do we differentiate or do you – because one of the objections to the categorical imperative is we can kind of add on conditions. So I'm not – it's not that I'm willing that you shouldn't right. you know, lie. It's that you know. My my general will is that people shouldn't lie except in instances where yeah, they're lying Kant to Nazis. Was personally challenged on this in, in his lifetime, not with Nazis, of course, because they didn't exist yet. But but he was challenged about what if a murderer comes to your door and wants to kill the person you're hiding? And frankly, I think he flubbed it. I think he made a, a botch of of his answer here. Uh, I I think that the correct answer is to say yes, you should not lie, and. The proper thing to do in that case is just to close the door. You're not obliged to tell the truth in all cases. I can't, I can't actually will that someone should always speak the truth about every single thing all the time. I, I think that is, you know, that is something that obviously, obviously also leads to. Well, it leads to a, a sort of, of disorganized thinking because I would, I would have to talk about how you're wearing a, a, a blue. Uh, tie and how you're wearing glasses, and 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 it would be it would be irrelevant, and it would be uh, it would actually be in a sense contrary to a, a you know the maxim that I ought to I ought to have organized thinking. Uh, I would have to talk about everything in order to never refrain from speaking things that I happen to know. That seems I mean, satisfying to well, me because it, it seems like in 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 the case of your harboring the fugitive that. Uh, like part of what is keeping them alive is the like positive inaction of this ruse. I can I can right? simply close the door. There, but you, there is but no obligation to lie. There is no obligation to tell the truth. There is no obligation to speak. You can't simply close the door I because could because they will interpret that as meaning that the person is there. We do if that all the time. You are in fear. If you are in fear that that is the case, there is there's another approach. If this, if you, you would like a, a, an approach that you would find more satisfying, another approach is to say that that in this particular case, you're presented with a choice. You either lie, or you become a party to. You become an accomplice to a murder. And you would have to ask then about a choice between two evils. And this is a choice that is forced upon you by the would-be murderer. He's forcing you to do one of those two things, uh, which, is, which is a circumstance that calls for, for uh, a you know, very difficult choice to be made. But, but clearly, there's a right choice and a wrong choice. So then this seems to get us into a weighing of situations. So we've, we've admitted that there's something wrong with lying um, because in general you shouldn't do it. And we've also said that getting – that being party even in this very passive way to the murder of an innocent is bad. Um, and so now it seems like choosing our – if we're going to act upon these maxims, we have to weigh these maxims against each other. And does that, does that import consequences back in or does it 
does it import desires back in? Like, because Kant's already said, you know, I mean, one of the things is if I am party to a murder, that's going to make me profoundly unhappy, and it's going to make obviously the person who was murdered profoundly unhappy. Well, it will um, certainly it will certainly make people unhappy, but Kant would say that murder is wrong not because it brings unhappiness. I mean, after all, you can find truly sadistic people who take pleasure in murder, and then and then suddenly murder is pleasurable. Uh, this is not why murder is wrong. Murder is wrong for him because murder treats one human being uh, as merely the means or as merely the tool for another human being's uh, goals or purposes, and that is a violation of what he called the second formulation of the categorical imperative. That runs as follows. So act as to treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of any other, in every case as an end and never merely as a means. So it would be a very direct violation of the categorical imperative in its second formulation if I were to help out with a murder because I would be treating the victim as a tool for uh, the, the scheme of some other human being. And that's, that's wrong. That's, that's a direct violation of the categorical imperative. Uh, one might say even that someone who proposes such a, a violation of the categorical imperative is not entitled to any sort of cooperation, including telling them the truth. That is, that is another way of, of, of getting out of the dilemma. So this, this second formulation, one of the misinterpretations that I think is relatively common or one of the objections to it. I certainly remember it coming up from clever people in the philosophy courses I took as an undergrad um, is this – that that would prohibit all sorts of activities because where you seem to be not treating the person exclusively as an end, that you seem to be treating them you know, so like commerce. Like if I buy something from you, I'm absolutely using you as a means to – I wouldn't be interacting with you if it weren't for me wanting this other thing from you. Um, and that's not quite right. Like we're, we did – Kant's not prohibiting um, commerce or bumming a cigarette off someone. Certainly not. He never intended to prohibit commerce. He never intended to prohibit uh, taking a philosophy seminar where people all learn from one another. Uh, he never intended to prohibit – uh, essentially all of society, which is what that interpretation of, of the second formulation would do. He did not want to make people all into, into monads. The idea here is that if you are going to uh, benefit from someone else, you don't treat them merely as a tool, that you act with an understanding that they are in fact people of an equal worth and dignity to you. It is an invitation to treat them as autonomous moral agents, which in fact they have the capacity to be even if they're not always perfect at it and that they have, they have just as much right to pursue their own ends and to, uh, to uh, engage in autonomous action as you do. And two people in the marketplace I think certainly, certainly fit that paradigm, I would say. Kant wrote much less than I would like about commerce, uh, but when he did write about commerce, he did not write to the effect that it ought to be banned universally. So, certainly not. So what's the – you said there were three formulations? There are three formulations and the third formulation is, is sort of closely related to the second. You can see almost how these two are, are uh, uh, related. Uh, the, it runs as follows. Every rational being must so act as if he were by his maxims in every case a legislating member in the universal kingdom of ends. So imagine that your actions – Imagine that your actions are establishing moral law for everyone who is like you, for all rational autonomous agents. So the maxim behind your action, which is not I want to be a historian, the maxim behind your action, which is something more like I think everyone should develop their talents. That is the thing that you ought to ask yourself about and ask yourself whether whether through your actions, whether through your actions, it should become the law for everyone, and whether you, as as a legislating member of the kingdom of ends, are making a good law for everyone or a bad law. So all three of these categorical imperatives, all three of the formulations of it, are about action, are about willing, taking, undertaking certain actions, willing that certain actions would be done by others or would be universal. Does Kant? Because we could – you and I could take the same action for very different reasons. Trevor Burrus Certainly and the reasons were key for him, absolutely key. Uh, 
you're supposed to want things for the right reasons, not for bad reasons. So uh, I might follow the law for fear of punishment, but to Kant, that's not a good reason. I would rather – or Kant would rather have people follow the law for the apprehension that the law is a good one and the recognition of the law's fundamental justice and the recognition that where there is a just law, you have an obligation to obey it uh, rather than saying, oh, no, I, no, they might put me in prison for this. How do we get from that, from this idea of the goodwill, from the idea of autonomy, the categorical imperative, how do we get from that to a political system? The first thing to observe here is that if you look at the second formulation of the categorical imperative, governments violate this all the time. Governments treat their citizens merely as a means to an end. I think this is almost impossible to deny. Governments treat people as tools. They treat them as a means to an end, the end of achieving some greater social goal that lies outside of them and that is, is perhaps not wanted by them and therefore they are coerced. So a, a very good example of a modern libertarian who takes this view and whose libertarianism is based on a kind of Kantianism is Robert Nozick. Nozick's anarchy state and utopia is sometimes attacked as being without foundations, but this to me seems just grossly unfair. It seems, it seems a, a completely unfair charge to make because Nozick in fact says that his libertarianism does come from the Kantian consideration that people are ends in themselves and not to be treated merely as a means to some other end. So to me, this, is, this, is, uh, this opens up a very clear uh, prospect for a, a Kantian libertarianism. Now, the problem with that is that Kant himself was not always as libertarian as we might want him to be. He wasn't politically identical to Robert Nozick. He was relatively a classical liberal for his time. He was quite a good classical liberal for his time in a lot of ways, but he was not a modern libertarian. He was not Nozickian in, in his, his uh, politics. Could you give an example of one of these, uh, these undesirable deviations of Kant's? Well, sure. Kant did not believe that there was a right to revolution against the state. He did not believe that there was a right to overthrow an unjust state. Uh, I disagree with that. I think that's that's absolutely wrong. Uh, he did though have he did have some very libertarian ideas about the freedom of the press, about uh, civic and social equality, about uh, the importance of private property in civil society. He had he had a, a particular theory of private property and how it how it develops in society, which uh, maybe we'll have some time to get into. But but I think it's I think it's a very interesting contribution that he made to to the idea of, of, of private property. And uh, so, so yeah, in a lot of ways, he's very much a classical liberal, uh, not entirely a modern libertarian though, certainly not by a long shot. May I ask a bit more about this idea that the state uses people as ends or as means instead of as ends, putting on my, let's say my Bernie bro hat. It's kind of a trucker hat, yeah. but like it's got some ironic slogan on the, the brim. I don't know. It's it's from some microbrew place. Yeah. Uh, they would say, look, these things that government does, the, the things that they would support, that a Bernie Sanders person would support, that we might think are using people. Um, so redistributional taxation, say, we're going to take money from you to give it to the poor or pay for education or something else, um, that these aren't, yes, we're using you as a means. Absolutely. But Kant hasn't denied that we can use someone as a means. We just aren't allowed to use them exclusively as a means. But what we're doing as the state in this instance is you're an end as well. Like we are doing this for your own good. You participate in the common good by paying for by paying for education, by instituting a welfare program, by regulating corporations, whatever else. We are enhancing the common good, which a like improves your life because you're part of this society. Um, and B, if you don't want it, that's just because you're mistaken, you're acting not in goodwill. The whole basis of enforcing the law, um, a law against murder, right? Like we're not – the murderer says like when you, you lock me up, you're just using me as an ends. You know, you're whatever it happens to be, protection for other people or promoting justice or something like that. Um, 
or using me as a means, sorry. And so you don't have a right to do that, but we would say no, like, you know, you can't, if you're, if the ends you might desire are undesirable or wrong or don't comport with the general will, but are we dependent upon kind of importing pre-existing libertarian ideas into Kant in order to say that the state violates the categorical imperative? I would have to respond to a person like that by saying that they are the ones doing the importing. They've imported an idea of a general or collective good that is not found in the categorical imperative. And, and this is also Nozick's critique of exactly that move. Uh, I'm going to quote a little bit from, from Nozick here. The moral side constraints upon what we may do, I claim, reflect the fact of our separate existences. They reflect the fact that no moral balancing act can take place among us. There is no moral outweighing of one of our lives by others so as to lead to a greater overall social good. There is no justified sacrifice of some of us for others. So the idea of the collective good is actually the part that's the non-starter here. There isn't a collective good. There is either the treatment of people as ends in themselves or not. So if uh, that's the right way to interpret Kant, why aren't uh, most Kantians also libertarians like you or I? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I, I think that these are the right implications to draw from Kant. I think that Kant should have been more consistent about them than he personally was. But I do know that there have been Kantian socialists. There are Kantian communitarians. There are Kantians of a lot of, of other political persuasions. And I think that one of the reasons why uh, there is this kind of diversity is because it's possible to look at the entire field of economics, which we don't consider at all trivial or a small matter, uh, to look at the entire field of economics as a question not of, of uh, fundamental principles or of the categorical imperative but as one of prudence. Uh, Kant made a distinction in his ethics between those matters that were governed by universal maxims and that were, were matters derived from some formulation of the categorical imperative on the one hand and those that were properly considered circumstantial on the other hand. So if I uh, notice that it is very cold outside, I should probably give my daughter warm clothes before she goes outside to play. That's, that's kindness, but it's situationally relative. It depends on, it depends on, on the context. If I, if I bundle her up in a, a warm coat when it's, when it's uh, the middle of the summer, uh, she's not going to be having fun. She's going to be miserable. And so that's not a kindness. That's actually kind of foolish. So, so there, are, there are what he called, there are what he called you know, categorical imperative maxims of, of universal morality. But on the other hand, there are counsels of prudence that depending on certain circumstances, depending on, on the situations you observe around you, you will act differently and you should act differently. And it's possible to consider that questions like what is the best form of economics, what is the best economic system, might actually be matters of prudence rather than of universal morality. And uh, people may say, hey, look, I, I, you know, I don't necessarily hate capitalism, but I have, I, I have you know, made certain observations about it and I, I don't think it really works all that well. And so it needs to be corrected. It needs to be amended in certain ways and we're allowed to do that. So a Kantian could argue himself into, into a different approach to, uh, to uh, economics and, and particular to uh, redistributive economics in that way. Uh, I would say then we're having an empirical debate. We're not having a debate about uh, about you know, fundamental ethical principles. But uh, but we can have that debate, and we can we can talk about about which social system or which economic system is uh, is preferable. So do you do you think it's usually a uh, a mistake about an empirical question that leads people to not go from Kantianism to libertarianism? Is there is there also a common uh, like theoretical error people make? Like we talked about, like not taking the separateness of persons seriously, uh, you know. And I, I don't know the answer to this question. But... And I think it's a combination of both because I have read I have read some Kantian socialist arguments to the effect of uh, yes, people in the market in fact use one another as tools and merely as tools and as nothing else, and. 
I don't I don't think I agree with that, but they do appear convinced by it. So so there there are two different there are two different disagreements here potentially. Yes. Seems like an opportunity you mentioned earlier that Kant had an interesting argument for a regime of private property. Yes. Um, and so counter the the people, the communitarians and the socialists, um, what does Kant say about this? So Kant believed that private property rights were potentially legitimate. Claims about private property were potentially legitimate. Uh, he disagreed with the Lockean account of private property. Uh, listeners may recall that Locke believed that private property was acquired by homesteading. So you stake a claim to uh, a territory by, by you know, putting up some sort of visible mark and then by improving it. And and mixing the, your labor. The mixed labor with the property gave you a, a claim upon it. Uh, Kant would not have said that. Kant would have said all that is sufficient to establish a provisional claim of private property is that you make the assertion that you have this and it's yours. Now, the problem with this provisional claim and, and the problem with, with all such provisional claims is that there are going to be disputes about it. And for Kant, the reason we enter into civil society is to resolve those sorts of disputes, to have a mediator, which will be the government, that will uh, intervene when disputes arise and will attempt to settle them in some just manner. Now, uh, obviously, obviously, a government is never going to do that work perfectly and some residual injustice will remain in civil society for a very, very long time. In fact, Kant wrote about the entire project of human history as being one of gradually improving the justice of society and of gradually rooting out all of the, uh, the significant or, or detectable faults in our, in our regime of law and of private property and of, of uh, social relations. And uh, he said, look, no one is going to be able to see the final result of this from, from where we sit here in the 18th century or, or he might say from where we sit here in the 20th century that, that justice is a process of eventual refinement. Human lives are very, very short. Uh, we only get a, a chance to work on a little bit of the great project of humanity, which is building a just society. But it begins with it begins with the establishment of certain claims, and then the attempt to peacefully adjudicate them and refine them and make make better and better claims about who is entitled to what uh, legitimate claims in society. Does taking Kant's argument seriously force us to? conclude anarchism or at, at most voluntarism? Does it – can we get to – do you think it's possible to get to anything more than that, to a robust classical liberalism or a constitutional republic or anything that's not basically purely voluntary without violating these basic principles? Kant's own belief was that there would be a – universal regime of representative Republican government that in time, eventually this is where everything would end up, that there would be a broadly classical liberal representative Republican government everywhere. Uh, not, not that it would be a one world government necessarily but that all governments would increasingly come to resemble this ideal. Uh, that's not the only answer that's been given. Uh, I have certainly read Kantian anarchists who have said the ideal toward which human society is trending is a regime of, yes, private property but citizenship without statehood, without there being a state. And citizens in this stateless society would have the rights that we expect citizens to have certainly and, and probably many more that, that are, are not uh, vindicated in our current society. And they would be in a sense, in a sense much more free than we are today. So we have these uh, provisional property claims which uh, are we, – we need institutions to adjudicate whether those are state institutions or some kind of anarchist institutions. Does uh, – does uh, Kant offer any uh, guidance about like what would uh, constitute a just 
claim versus an unjust one? How how are we just supposed to muddle through? He did offer he did offer uh, suggestions about this. Uh, there there are there are suggestions. Uh, he suggests that. Yes, labor is one factor that you ought to consider. He was not entirely hostile to to lock in claims about desert in in terms of in terms of uh, the labor that people had put into a thing. Uh, he was concerned with questions like uh, reparations for past injustices and and uh, you know much of the the same sort of uh, some sort of territory that we would expect a, a classical liberal account of property to have. The, the idea was that eventually and uh, you know, in the fullness of time, the need to resort to force to adjudicate these things would have to retreat, that uh, the goal here would be to have claims about property that were more and more defensible, that were more and more uh, built into sort of the institutional and the ethical understandings of, of people in the society that, uh, that the work of government would eventually lessen. So th this is sort of the idea that our, our rights are, are only the most secure when they're, they're not up for debate even. Yes. Yes. I think, I think that's right. Yes. I mentioned at the beginning that we get among libertarians, um, there's sizable contingent that are fairly anti-Kant. Um, or at least, if you mention Kant, they'll they'll boo and hiss, and that this is Statist. largely because um, a great number of libertarians became libertarians or got serious about it after reading Rand, Ayn Rand, and Rand was, let's just say, she was not a fan of Immanuel Kant. But most people who have studied Kant are a little bit baffled by Rand's take on him or at least think that the the criticisms of him i.e. that he he abolished the enlightenment by embracing relativism um, she is, straight up calls him the most evil man in human history right i, I, like, I think that's completely undeserved I, I you know my own my own ethical views are close to kant's i think it's completely undeserved that that uh, he was called that i would say hegel is obviously the most evil the most evil philosopher who's ever lived, uh, but but uh, I do think that uh, she has both good and bad reasons to object to Kant. Rand was in her metaphysics an objective realist. Kant was an idealist. Uh, he had a very different idea of, of metaphysics, which we don't have to we don't have to get into in, in any depth right here. But but there's there's a big big disagreement there. Uh, you know, Kant was a, a deontologist in his ethics and Rand at least professed to be a virtue ethicist. I think that she's closer to deontology myself than she cared to admit. But, Rand's virtue ethics don't sound much like any other virtue but, ethics. But she claimed to be a virtue ethicist. She claimed to be in the tradition of, of Aristotle and Aquinas and if you are in fact in that tradition, then yes, you're not always going to agree with Kant and you'll have some good reason to disagree with him. I mean, you know, if this is where you come from, then you're not necessarily going to see eye to eye. Uh, there were also though some unfounded objections to Kant that she made. So she claimed that Kant was a proponent of pure absolute altruism, which I don't, I, I don't understand how she even came by this view because Kant is very explicit that pure altruism fails the categorical imperative. It cannot be universalized. It is not even potentially a, a part of his ethics. So, uh, so I, I don't know why she said this. I think she was just wrong about it. And, uh, I, I would say, at least on that basis, there, there isn't really there isn't really much room for argument. Kant is is quite clear himself about about rejecting pure altruism. You should have benevolence toward other people. Kant said you should you should practice being kind to them. But uh, this is one of those things where the counsels of prudence must play a part. He said you cannot turn this into something categorical that you have an absolute obligation to be at all times and perfectly an altruist. He, he thought that was nonsense. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, some reasons that a person who accepts Kantianism might uh, reject libertarianism. Uh, how about we then also discuss 
Uh, what are some reasons that someone would just re reject the Kantian uh, moral program generally, like at, at its foundation? Sure. So uh, a lot of a lot of objections to Kant center on the idea that these these uh, formulations of the categorical imperative are just so hopelessly abstract that you can't really bring them to bear on on practical ethical questions and. Uh, Therefore, what good are they? Why, why do you talk about these things when uh, they actually don't really achieve very much? Uh, Hegel, for example, faulted Kant for having this sort of empty formalism, he called it, that, that these, are, these are things that sound very nice but they really have no practical impact unless you fill in some of the hypothetical details, some of the situational details and then, and then suddenly we're not really doing the type of ethical reasoning that you know, Kant himself claimed that we ought to be doing. I don't personally agree with this. I, I don't agree with it because I think that this objection rests on a misunderstanding of what Kant was trying to do. He was not trying to provide a set of rules for all conduct in all situations that could be derived as uh, one might derive proofs in, in uh, uh, geometry. This is not what he's trying to do. He's trying to say that these are necessary preconditions for any kind of good ethical behavior, but they're not sufficient. They're not sufficient for deriving the entirety of the good life. To do that, you need to know about circumstance. You need to consult the counsels of prudence. You need to integrate these things into uh, your ethical decision making. Now, your decision making has to be consistent with the categorical imperative. It must not, though, be taken as the only thing that will guide you in all of life, and therefore you're set. That's that's a misunderstding. Uh, what about the objection that, uh, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'd, I'd like to come back to it. That when we're talking about you know determining the maxim upon which we're acting. And you say, well, it's wrong to say that everyone should be historian and it's right maybe or better at least to say uh, that everyone should try to like, you know, fulfill their, you know, potential in the world or something. But there's a whole lot of ground in between there and even – you could even go like more abstract than that. You could say that like I can, you know, will that everyone should uh, – you know, do the right thing, which is just hopelessly empty, right? But but also true. Well, I mean, that's that's easy to will, but it doesn't have it doesn't have a lot of formal content to it. Now, uh, you could also have mid levels of abstraction. So rather than everyone must live up to their potential, or everyone must cultivate their talents, rather than saying that, or saying everyone must become a historian, you could say everyone must read books. It's a really good thing to read books. Now, that's somewhere in between in terms of specificity. Uh, I might actually be able to will that one. I think I could. I think that if you have the capacity to read, then you are in fact not living up to your potential if you systematically neglect reading. You ought to, you ought to spend some share of your life reading books. It's a good thing to do. Uh, this, is, this is a part of cultivating one very important part of your faculties. So, so uh, you know, there is room here. Now, the point of the point of having these conversations, the point of thinking about the point of thinking about ethics in these terms, is not necessarily to set up a large system of propositions, all of which must be followed. It's to give you guidance uh, in thinking about why you act for certain for certain reasons. You know, whether your reasons are defensible or not. And, uh, and so uh, we, we ought not to imagine that it can be derived like geometry. You know, I, I can come up with, with other maxims that lie behind my decision to become a historian that, uh, that might be either more or less specific and maybe I could or couldn't will them. I'd have to think about it. I'd have so, to think about it. So it sounds like there is some, some ambiguity here or, but – Maybe it's not necessarily the case that it's a problematic kind of ambiguity. I, I would call it a creative and productive ambiguity. So you mentioned that we can have a universal maxim that people should read books um, and including arguments for liberty in that maxim is probably – That's that's just uncontroversial. Yeah. So for someone who's potentially interested in exploring Kant more and given his enormous and continuing influence on – the Western intellectual tradition, he's he's worth absolutely exploring more. They can start by 
reading your chapter in Arguments for Liberty. But one of the concerns about Kant is that he's notoriously difficult. You don't – few people will pick up the critique of pure reason as beach reading. Well, the critique of pure reason is also I would say his most difficult book. That is not an easy read. Uh, it's also happily not one you have to read to understand his political or his ethical thought. Uh, I've got a list in the back which I recommend. Most of these books are, are fortunately in the public domain. Uh, Liberty Fund has a lot of them online for free which, uh, which means that uh, you know, there are very, very few uh, practical burdens to, uh, to fulfilling your, your uh, categorical obligations here, I guess you could say. Uh, the, the critique of practical reason as opposed to the critique of pure reason is, is relatively much more readable. Uh, one of the most accessible short pieces of Kantian philosophy is uh, the uh, idea for universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. If you are interested in what you've heard here, you should pick that up. Uh, it's not something that libertarians will agree with in all of its particulars, but it is uh, very accessible. It is very short. It is very stimulating, and uh, it's a good sort of entry point into how he thinks about questions of history and politics. Thank you, Jason Kuznicki, for being with us today to discuss your chapter in Arguments for Liberty. Uh, the book's available at libertarianism.org and in bookstores everywhere and on Amazon. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Teresa Terrible. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.